It's good. Let's stand to our feet. We are the people of God, and we have a song to sing of praise this morning.
in it.
just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind cause I know there is peace within his presence I speak Jesus Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family. Father, we thank you for the power that is in your name. We thank you for your word, Father, that you've given us. We believe your word. We make a decision to receive your word. We stand on your word today, Father, because you have never failed us, and you have always hastened to perform your word.
said it, and I believe it. He said it, and it is done. Father, we establish our lives today, our hearts today on you, on to your word. Father, as Jesus was tempted at the end of 40 days of fasting by the enemy, Father, he got a good testimony and overcame the enemy of all the temptations that he brought him by saying, it is written, and then he confessed the word and spoke the word. And after those three temptations, the enemy left him. But he left us a blueprint on what to do when the tests come, when the temptations come. If we know the Word, we'll start speaking the Word of God, saying, He said it, I believe it. He said it, and it's done. And then we speak the Word of God out of our mouth, authorizing the anointing on that Word to bring to pass what that Word has said and promised to us, that it'll cause us victory, it'll cause us triumph, It'll cause us to win over every test, every trial, every circumstance. Even if we're facing a mountain of a problem, Jesus said to speak to that mountain. And if you believe it, that it'll be removed. Jesus spoke to the storm. He spoke to the weather. He spoke to the waters. And they obeyed him. Jesus told us to like it and do the same thing. Speak the Word of God. Use the name of Jesus and the Word of God. And that Word will surely come to pass. Father, we set our hearts on the Word today. Thank you for giving us the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, who was our teacher, teaching us all truths. Thank you, Father, every person in this room today, in this church today, in this building today. Father, that they have ears to hear. They want to hear the Word. They want to be taught the Word. They're hungry for the Word. They want to learn the Word. And Father, revelation will flow to them. The anointing will flow to them. The eyes of their understanding will be enlightened. Father, that they'll know your will that you have intended for every person in the body of Christ and for them individually. So, Father, we look to you these last days you alone are our author and the finisher of our faith. Careful to praise you. Careful always to give you all the glory and all the honor. Thank you once again for what you have done, what you are doing, what you will be doing, and we give you all the praise, give you all the glory. In Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name, amen and amen. Turn around and shake somebody's hand and say, God said it. And I believe, I believe it, it, and that settles it. Settles. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. Well, open your Bibles, if you would, this morning to the book of 2 Timothy again. 2 Timothy, last, last Sunday, we looked at which is easier, and how many know it's easy to get forgiveness, and it's easy to get healed. Everybody say, it's easy to get forgiveness, and it's easy to get healed. Say it again. It's easy to get forgiveness. And it's easy to get here. Now, see, a lot of people argue with that. It's probably some of you thinking, well, I don't know about it. I, I know it's easy to get forgiveness, but I'm not sure about that healing thing. Well, take that same faith that you believe when you pray the prayer of repentance and take that same faith and turn it over on a different subject and say, Father, thank you. Healing is mine. The price has been paid. By his stripes, I was healed. Say it with me. By his stripes, I was healed. Open your Bibles, if you would, to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. We're coming back to the subject on the vessels of honor because obviously one day we're going to all stand before the Lord in the judgment seat of Christ. He's going to be the head of the church. He is the head of the church. And he's going to judge his children for what they did or what they didn't do. And certainly, vessels of honor it certainly means what kind of representative were we on this earth? Were we, were we representing Christ? Or do we have our own plans and our own agenda? And God's telling us we can be a vessel of honor or we can be a vessel of dishonor. And I don't think any of us want to be a vessel of dishonor. But once again, it's in the Word. So we have to cover it because there are lots of times people come to church for different reasons. But notice in verse 19, if you would, please. 
2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 19, and he's liking vessels as people, and what they do in these bodies, does it bring glory to God, does it represent the kingdom, or does it represent them in their carnal flesh? But he said in verse 19, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. And he said that on the heels of people that were preaching error, preaching wrong doctrine, saying things and teaching things that were wrong. They said the resurrection of the dead already happened, and it hadn't. And notice the word, verse 18, it points that out. Because there are some people that still think that happened, but it hasn't happened yet. But it will happen. Everybody say, but it will happen. But nevertheless, even though people teach the word wrong, they teach it in error, the Word of God is still a sure foundation, and it's not going away. Nevertheless, the, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are His. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ, talking about naming Christ as your Lord and Savior, accepting Jesus into your heart. Notice the last three words. He's writing this to believers. He said, depart from iniquity or depart from sin. Everybody say, depart from sin. Now, isn't that amazing? You know, we don't think about that, but every once in a while, people come to church, they're born again, they're Christians, but they have sin in their life. Paul's writing, inspired by the Holy Ghost, to tell Timothy, who's pastoring the church at Ephesus, hey, listen, tell that group there they need to depart from iniquity, or they need to separate themselves, or stop sinning. Look at your neighbor and go, stop sinning. As a matter of fact, stand up this morning. We can move around a little bit this morning. Turn around, turn around and move around a little bit and point to a couple of people. Do it nice now and say, stop sinning. Well, this is your chance to take a shot. Stop sinning. Hallelujah. That's a word for everybody because it determines how people look at us. There are people going by right now on 522 that are driving by here. They're probably neighbors of some of you. They're looking to see your vehicle out there. They see your car in the parking lot. Their thinking is, if you're going to church, then you should be acting like, looking like, and talking like a Christian. What they don't understand is you go to church, and they don't see the change. Something doesn't equate to them. By the way, Jesus in his earthly ministry, he was confronted by the Pharisees, by the Sadducees, by the doctors of the law, the people that were supposed to be teachers of the Word of God the ones that were supposed to be examples to the people of God, Israel at that time. He called them hypocrites. Why did he call them hypocrites? They had the Word. They had the law. They were quick to tell other people to do it, but they weren't doing it. That's the definition of a hypocrite. When you know what to do and you don't do it, and then, boy, it's really bad when you tell people to do it, but you don't do it, that's the definition of a hypocrite. By the way, he also told them in John's Gospel, chapter 8, he called the religious leaders. And by the way, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the doctors of the law, they were all set up by God in the Old Covenant. But once again, you may be in an office, in a position, but you still need to do, you need to be following God. They weren't following God. They were making their own rules. They were kept making rules. This is why Jesus came and he said, the traditions of men. Say it with me, the traditions of men. Look at the name of the traditions of men. Do men have traditions? They most certainly do. Some of them are godly. Some of them are not godly. Some of them are kind of half. They got a little bit of God mixed in, enough to kind of entice people. But the whole purpose of it really, in the ending of it, it's not godly. And Jesus said the traditions of men make the Word of God of none effect. That's why you hear me say this all the time. Those of you who have sat under this ministry, I'll tell you all the time, go back to the Word. Find out what the Word says. Man has a lot of religious ideas that sound right. There's a somewhat of a Bible base to it. But once again, it's false doctrine. It's wrong teaching. And so here we go with verse 20. Everybody say verse 20. He said, but in a great house. Notice he's referring to the church as a great house. Everybody say, the church is a great house. Say it again, the church is a great house. See, every one of you are temples of the living God. You are a mini version of the temple of God or the house of God. When you leave here, you are taking the Holy Ghost with you. Paul said, and he declares it by the Spirit of God, 
that our lives are written epistles. The word epistle means a letter. What does that mean? When you leave the church of God, when you leave the sanctuary of God, when you leave the presence of God in your personal time, what happens? You go out and you live and you conduct your life and people are watching you and reading you like a letter. They're finding out if what you say and what you do on your Sundays and Wednesdays, and you say you're a Christian, if it lines up with how you know the Word of God. They're reading you. You say, well, pastor, they shouldn't be judging me. Well, listen, they're going to judge you. The world is going to judge you. You just need to know that. That shouldn't upset you. Really, it gets people upset when they talk about judgment because they're afraid they might get judged because they may find flaws that they know about. Well, let's do what verse 19 says. Depart from iniquity. Everybody say, depart from iniquity. Well, look at your neighbor and go, clean up your act. You know, if you're, afraid of, if you're afraid of being judged, which you're going to be judged, are you having something to hide? If you don't have anything to hide, I like what Paul said. Paul knew he was being judged and criticized by people all the time. Everything he said, everything he did, the, the church at Corinth that he pioneered, that he started, go back and study his writings to them. They were mocking and making fun of him. Apparently, Paul was a short man and bald. Apparently, Paul, when he would speak, wasn't the greatest speaker. But he said, I didn't come to you with man's words of enticing wisdom. I came to you in the power of the Spirit. How many of you want the Holy Ghost power? Now, how many of you know we need the Word and we need the Spirit? Say it with me. We need the Word. We need the Spirit. So they would make fun of Paul because of how tall he was because he was bald, because he wasn't a good speaker. And yet Paul said, I'm judged of no man. In other words, he was saying, you can judge me all you want to. The only judgment I'm concerned about is when I stand before the Jesus and get judged by him. Ultimately, people are going to judge you. You just know that. Don't get upset about it. Live your life before Christ. Live it openly, and then go ahead and on judgment day, you're going to hear these words, well done. How many of you want to hear that? It's not going to be based on what people thought. It's going to be based on what Jesus and how he judged you. Aren't you glad for that? Now, let's read on. He said in verse 20, But in a great house there are, no, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and earth. Everybody say it. Gold and silver, wood and earth. So there are two types of vessels. Those vessels that are very valuable and those are vessels that are very precious and those vessels that are wood and earth and some to honor and some to dishonor. Everybody say it, some to honor, some to dishonor. What's he saying? In the church. In the church. You don't be surprised if you find people who were very much involved, very committed to Christ, and then there are other people that you never know if they're going to show. They never put their hand to the plow. They never do anything. They just, you know, you can't count on them. And once again, this is what he's talking about right in the church. This has been happening for thousands of years. If you study the letters of the epistles, you'll find out that there would be people that get on fire, then they'd backslide. Other people would repent, they'd go a little while, and then they'd leave the church. Yet we see these things going on all the time in church, and we go, what's going on? Well, we have an enemy. You've got an enemy. Say it with me. i got an enemy. You have an enemy to contend with. If the enemy can't get in the church, then he tries to give external things, external pressures. He'll try to pressure you from the outside. If he can't pressure you from the outside through persecution or through other tests and trials, then listen, then he realizes the only way I can get is I've got to get in the church. Everybody say, get in the church. By the way, we have a word in the next chapter of this writing that the Holy Spirit warned Timothy to tell the church that doctrines of, the doctrines of devils were going to try to infiltrate the church inside. If you can't stop it outside, then you've got to get inside. How does he get inside? He gets inside because people inside Yield to him and not God. Now it gets quiet. 
Do you know one minute you can be led by the Spirit of God, the next minute you can be in the flesh? One minute you can be speaking the Word of God, the next minute you can be cussing and swearing. One minute you can be in the joy of the Lord, and the next minute you can be in the flesh mad. You have a flesh to contend with. You have an enemy to contend with. His goal and purpose in this room for, against everybody is he doesn't want anybody to succeed. But I'm telling you, if you're determined, and see, you need to be determined. If you're determined to grow, he cannot stop you from growing. Paul said, Satan hindered me. But notice, he didn't stop me. He'll throw things at me. And by the way, he was persecuted, probably like nobody outside of Jesus. Do we have a list of, written in the Scriptures of all the things happened to him, and yet he kept going. I like what he said. Uh, actually, he was, at a, he was at a house, and these daughters came, and they prophesied to him about, listen, if you go to this town, you need to understand they're going to put you in bonds and chains. And I like what Paul said. He said, none of these things move me. Everybody said, none of these things move me. Everybody said, none of these things move me. How many of you want to be the vessel of gold and silver? How many of you want to be that individual when the Lord goes, wow, you've come a long way? Because see, that some sense of the word, whether you, which one you become is up to you. Whether you become that vessel of honor or that vessel of dishonor, it's up to you. It's not a predestination. If you want to go that route, God has already predestined you to be with Him. He has already predestined you to win. But He will not force any of that on you if you don't want it. So it's up to you. God's already got the plan laid out, but it's up to you. I like this verse of Scripture. Write it down, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, one of my favorite Scriptures. It says, Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph. People want to know, what's God doing this day? He's causing me to win. How often is He going to do that? Always. Every situation, it's the plan of God that He's causing us to triumph. Everybody say, the plan of God right now for my life is to cause me to triumph. Now, he's got a plan, but you have to follow it because obviously he's not in control of everything. Now, I want us to go back to Galatians chapter 2, Galatians chapter 2, and I want you to see some of these things written in the Word that sometimes people kind of overlook it and they don't realize what the early church and when Paul's writing and when Peter's writing and when John was writing, the persecution that they had to endure. And by the way, the Scripture says, He that endureth to the end shall be saved. What does that mean? That means there's going to be some persecution. Now, it could specifically mean the end times. We're getting close to the end times. How many of you agree to that? That means what? There's going to be things we're going to have to endure. There's going to have to be things that are going to be thrown on us, not from God, but from the enemy. He's going to take one last two raw. He wants to try to take down as many Christians, as many people as he can so that they can go to hell with him, but I'm not going with him. I'm going to heaven. Anybody else want to go to heaven? Say it with me. I'm going to heaven. Look at him and say, I'm going to heaven. I don't know how many people I've talked to. They have a the struggle in their commitment with Christ. And many times it's with spouses and, and people that are, you know, they're looking and relying on people. And I said, listen, I got news for you. I appreciate the fact, you know, that you love them, you're your spouse. Well, I can't get him to go to church. And by the way, I've seen that on both sides of the fence. I've seen women committed to God. Husbands don't want to come. I've seen husbands committed. Women don't want to come. It's really irrelevant. The whole subject is what are you going to do with your relationship? I'm not going to hell for anybody. I'm going to heaven. I'm not going to let somebody pull me down. But it is my decision thinking I'm going to save them. Because Paul writes to the church at Corinth. And the Corinthian church, they were very carnal. And he called them carnal. That means they were flesh ruled. That means they were still ruled by their senses, their human senses. He told them, he said, you might win your spouses over. Because what happened was, when Paul began to preach to them, some of the couples that were married, one spouse would get saved and the other spouse wouldn't get saved. And they were like, you know, we're kind of unequally yoked. And that thought was, we need to get divorced. 
And that's not what the Scripture said. The Bible says if you're already married to them, you don't divorce them. But it also says that your chaste virgin, your chaste lifestyle may win them over. Everybody say, may win them over. In other words, he's not guaranteeing you that if you live godly in Christ before your spouse, it'll win them over. But at least they'll see the difference in you and you give them a godly example. But that's our obligation. I can't make people get saved. But my obligation is to make sure I'm representing Jesus and the kingdom of God properly to them. If they're smart, they'll respond. Now, I want you to go back to that scripture. I said Galatians, but I want you to go back here to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And I want you to notice in verse 14, and we just quoted, but I want you to look at the latter half of it. Many times we read it, we have no clue what it means or what it says. But God is literally going to use the church. Everybody say it, use the church. God is literally going to and is using the church to represent him to a place where it makes it appealing to people to come in. And notice what he said in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14. Now, I told you the first half of that verse, but let's read the whole thing because the first half is about victory and us triumphing. Everybody say, I'm winning. Come on, say it again. I'm winning. How many of you like to win? Anybody ever get involved in sports? What do you do? You want to win. No matter what it is, you come down to our house when Mike Manuel's down there. We haven't done it for the last couple of years, but there were times where we would have a little, what's it called? Pass the pigs. The little rubber pigs that you roll, and it's a very simple game, and it's based on how the pigs end up rolling the amount of points. But if you roll them and the two pigs touch, you could be up 125 points, but if they touch and you rolled on that roll, then you lose all the points. Well, there was a time where we would have like a dozen people around our table, and we were up well past midnight playing this game of pass the pigs. And I have to tell you, one of the most competitive person I have ever known in my life for games is Mike Manuel. Mike Manuel absolutely does not like to lose at anything. He gets so discouraged when he's like three points away from winning the game, so he rolls the pigs, and the pigs end up touching and lose all the points. It is hilarious to see the way he acts. Why? I just believe it's in us to win. How many know it's more fun to win? How many of you like winning? How many of you like achieving? It's a sense of like, yeah, I can do this. I did something right. But now notice in verse 14, 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14, now thanks be unto God. This is something that we can give thanks to God for. Now, thanks be unto God, which, how often, church? Always. Say it again, always. Come on, look at your neighbor and go, always is always. How often is always? Always. Now, thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ, notice, and maketh manifest. The Savior, the word Savior here doesn't mean Savior as in Jesus. The word Savior means a fragrance, like a perfume, like an odor of His knowledge by us in every place. And literally what verse 14 is saying is, now that Christ is leading us, one translation says He has led us through a procession. He's leading us through a procession because we have the victory. Say it with me. I have the victory. Actually, in Christ, you do have the victory. I'll say it again. In Christ, write that down. In Christ, notice the verse. In Christ, you do have the victory. And how often do you have the victory? Everybody say, always. Come on, say it again. I always have the victory in Christ. Now, the second half of that verse is, what is he talking about? He's going to use you and I as we go out into the highways and byways and we tell the people, about the knowledge of the Word of God and what Jesus has done. And listen, the Bible says when we do that, it's going to be a sweet fragrance. It's going to be a sweet odor. It's going to be pleasant to people. It's going to be something that they'll, it's going to catch their attention because it's going to be different than religion. Religion would tell you to just suck it up, just hold on. But now here the Bible says, I have the victory. Everybody say it, I have the victory. So verse 14, the latter half of it, God's going to use the church to give out the knowledge of the Word of God about Jesus 
And God's going to look down at smell and go, oh, I like that smell. I like when my kids are preaching the Word. I like when, the, when my kids are telling the Word of God. It's a sweet smell to his nose. That's a good thing. Everybody say, that's a good thing. Now, go back, if you would, to 2 Timothy. Actually, go back to Galatians. Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter, no, Galatians chapter 2. Notice Galatians chapter 2. I want to talk to you just a little bit about false brethren. False brethren. Everybody say it, false brethren. How many of you have seen somebody, they said they were a Christian, but you kind of thought, I don't know about that. Anybody ever been there before? And I'm like, man, I just, you say, and, and we know we're not being critical, but when I, when I hear somebody is a Christian, I don't know about you. I'm sure I'm not the only person that does that. But when somebody tells me they're a Christian, at some point in time, I should see something that replicates Jesus. I, I should see something that that that's, the word comes out of their mouth eventually. The, that their conduct of their life should be replicating something that Jesus did. And I don't know about you, but I do this. I bait people. I bait people to find out where they're at. And, and I intentionally bring up God into conversation at different times. And it's not overwhelming. It's not preachy. It's just something I'll bring up about God. And I'll do it multiple times. And I find out a lot of times these people that claim to be Christians, they never jump on board with the Word. They never want to talk about Jesus. They never want to, you know, express what they've learned about Christ. And I can't help but think, I don't know. You know, I'm, I'm trying to get them into this conversation about Jesus, and it's like they don't want to talk about him. You know, we're not supposed to be ashamed of him. I said we're not supposed to be ashamed of him. I said we're not supposed to be ashamed of him. We're supposed to seize every opportunity. We should be looking for opportunities. There have actually been times where I have created opportunities. A couple of years ago, my, my one pickup truck broke down on the interstate coming over by Frederick on I-70, Frederick, Maryland, and this young man picked me up in a rollback, roll brought me all the way over up to a, uh, a garage over in Houston town, and, and so we started talking. And I don't tell people I'm a pastor because, see, I, I want to know really how they think and how they act. If I tell them that, lots of times this religious shield will go up. And I really want to find out about the real person. So I just talk to them, which is kind of, if you really knew me in the beginning of my years, I wouldn't say nothing to anybody. I just keep my mouth shut. But now I've got something to say. Everybody say, now I've got something to say. Now I've got more to say about Jesus. So I do. And I remember about, got around Hagerstown. He, he brought up the subject and the situation about God. And I thought, uh-oh, here's my door. And man, I mean, the door opened up. And how many know, if they open the door up, walk through it. And I did. And we talked about God the rest of the way home. And he said, I have never, ever heard any of this stuff from the Bible that you're sharing with me. I said, it's in the Word of God. I said, write these scriptures down. It's right in the Bible, right in the Word. And man, then he started asking me all these questions about what the Bible says and about the end times and about heaven and all these things. Why? I looked for an opportunity. I mean, I'm ready for an opportunity. Everybody say, I'm ready for an opportunity. Now, see, if you go back and you read verse 21 and verse 22, that's exactly what the writer is talking about here. Paul is saying, get yourself spiritually fit so that when God creates an opportunity for you, that you open the door and walk in it and begin to share Jesus. So why? So when we do that, God gets a sweet smell in his nose. We're sharing his knowledge. We're to tell his knowledge. Now notice, Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. Are you there? Notice Galatians chapter 2. And I want you to notice Paul in dealing with situations. Notice Galatians chapter 2 and verse 1. He had to deal with false brethren. Do false brethren appear in the church? Absolutely false brethren appear in the church. What does that mean? That means they're going to look like they're Christians but eventually, after a while, we're going to reveal that they're not true Christians. Notice in verse 1, Galatians 2, verse 1. Then 14 years after I went up again into Jerusalem, or the church, the first church, and it said, with Barnabas, and took Timus, or Titus with me also, and I went up by revelation. 
and communicated with them that gospel which I also preached unto the Gentiles. And of course, you can read this, talking about in Acts chapter 15. He said, but privately to them which were of reputation. In other words, I talked to the leaders or the apostles at the church in Jerusalem. And he said, to them of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. In other words, he said, I went to the church. I went to the apostles of the church of Jerusalem. And he said, I went there and I was preaching to them and sharing the revelation that I got from Jesus. But I want to run it by you guys to make sure that I'm not just getting off track. Or otherwise, I'm just going to run in vain. You know, when you do things that are right, but it's done wrong, you wasted your time. That's what it means, I run in vain. So see, even Paul, even though he knows he got this revelation from Jesus, he's still going to run it by these guys that were the, 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 the apostles of the Lamb just to double check to make sure that he's not preaching and teaching something that's worthless and just wasting his time. He said, but neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek or a Gentile, was compelled to be circumcised. And if you go back to Acts 15, that was one of the hot topics of that day, should the Gentiles be circumcised into the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, men were supposed to be circumcised. It was a hot topic that had come up. Verse 4, and because of false brethren, everybody say because of false brethren. Did Paul run into false brethren? Did he have people that he thought were Christians that were not Christians? Everybody say, yes, he did. And he said, and because of false brethren unaware brought in. Remember Satan, he'll come to you. Paul writing by inspiration said, Satan can appear to you or a messenger of Satan as an angel of light. They come undercover. They come, listen, they're wolves, but they come dressed in sheep's clothing. They want to fit right in. Everybody say they want to fit right in. But if you remember, not last week, but two weeks ago, one of the verses we talked about in Matthew chapter 12, Jesus talked about planting seed and how God planted the seed and how the enemy came at nighttime and planted the seed. And we found out we got good seed and we got bad seed, meaning we have godly people and we have ungodly people. Everybody say it. Godly people and ungodly people. Say it again. Godly people, ungodly people. Say it one more time. Godly people and ungodly people. What kind of people do we have on the earth? Godly people and what? Ungodly people. See, this breaks down all of the gender, all of the race, all the money, all of that. And listen, when it all comes down to you're either godly or you're ungodly. Isn't it amazing how God simplifies things for us? If we just go to Him, He simplifies things for us. Now, notice, He said, they were brought in, they were unaware, brought in, who came in privately to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. What was the enemy's goal and purpose by bringing these people in unaware? He wanted to, that he wanted to use these people to come into the congregation to spread, to spread lies and hypocrisy to put people back under bondage. Within the context, he's talking about probably Jews who were not saved that were coming back in and telling people they needed to live under the law and go back under bondage. Isn't it so good that you got saved not by your works, but you got saved by the blood of Jesus Christ? The law you got right with God by doing work. Paul had to deal with that through his ministry the whole time. Oh, no, you've got to do it. And listen, by the way, you still have people that will refer to things going back under the law that God said he did away with it in the New Testament. And it is amazing. People want to put you back under bondage. Jesus wants you to be liberated. Say it with me. Jesus wants us to be liberated. You know, there are still people that think you're an old sinner, but you're saved by grace. No, I was a sinner. I'm not now. Now I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Say it again. I was a sinner, but now I'm a saint. Say it again. I was a sinner, but now I'm a saint. Say it again. I was a sinner, but now I'm a saint. Now go to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. And once again, you see the enemy coming into the church. I know as a pastor, 
Every time somebody new comes in, I got my spiritual antennas out there. And, and I feel like David, when David was run out of his king by Absalom, his son, I, I feel like just exactly what David said. He was in the wilderness. Sometimes he was hiding. And he would have a group of men that would come to David. And one day this group of men came to David, and David came out to greet them. And David said, are you for me or are you against me? Have you come to harm me or have you come to help me? And see, that's part of a pastor, being a shepherd. You want to find out when people come, are they sheep, are they goats, or are they wolves? Everybody say it, sheep, goats, or wolves. Believe it or not, there have been wolves that have come through here. But if you don't give them place and they don't have their way, they normally don't hang around. But they will try to take people with them. They will try to seduce them by their doctrine. They will try to get people to follow them. But the end is not going to be good. Does that happen today? Absolutely. And then you have goats that are in here. Goats are what? People who are resistant. They don't want to follow anybody. They want to go do their own thing. But now notice here in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26, once again, Paul is talking about, and actually he's telling them, guarding against false preaching. But notice here in what he had to deal with, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and let's start in verse 16, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 16. If you have it, say, I got it. He said, I say again, let no man think me a fool, if otherwise yet as a fool receive me, that I may boast myself a little. For which I speak, I speak it not after the Lord, but it were foolishly in this confidence of boasting. See that many, glorif see that many glorify, glo glory after the flesh, I will also too. In other words, Paul was saying, I'm just going to brag a little bit about some things that I've dealt with. And that's why he said it's not in the Lord. In other words, he's saying, not necessarily God telling me to say this, but I'm just kind of bragging at some of the things that I've had to deal with. He said, others have did it, so I'm going to do it. He said, for you suffer fools gladly, seeing you yourselves are wise. In other words, he's talking about people coming into the church, and you put up with fools, but you yourselves are wise. For you suffer if a man bring you into bondage, if a man devour you, if a man take of you, if a man exalt himself, if a man smite you on the face. I speak as concerning reproach as though we had been weak. Howbeit not in, not in so ever, and he is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. Are they Hebrews? So am I. And he's talking about these people coming in to the church at Corinth, and now they're seducing him. And all these things that they're doing, he said, oh, they're bold, all oh, they're brass. He see, sometimes they go, oh, my, they must be a God. Look how bold they are. No, they could be of the devil. I mean, the devil's bold. To prove it to you, i got a chapter and verse for you. Satan is as a roaring lion. He's bold. He's loud. He's brassy. He thinks he's right, but he also knows deep down he's going to lose. I know that because when Jesus cast out devils, they said, have you come to torment us before our time? They know where their final destination is. They don't want humanity to know that. Aren't you glad we get inside dibs with the Word of God? He said, are they, are they seeds of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, because he was whipped and beaten. In prison more frequent, in deaths or death threats often, many, many times. Of the Jews five times received I, received I 40 stripes, save one. In other words, five different times he got 39 stripes. Thrice was I beaten, once with a rod, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeys often, in perils of waters. Everybody say, in perils of water. In perils of robbers. He'd been around robbers. Not a good crowd to be with. In perils of my own countrymen. Other Jews. Been in perils. The word perils is a rough time, a bad place. In perils by the heathen. You ever go down, I remember when I went to Columbia, South America several years ago uh, with this individual, 
And I remember talking to a, a man who went over there from America, and he went over on missionary trips, and he told us, and he said, listen, he said, when you're over there and you go down, uh, particularly the one, the one uh, city that we were going to go into, uh, had, had thousands and thousands of people. He said, listen, he said, when you go there, he said, before you go down any street, any street, he said, I want you to stand at the end of that street and I want you to listen to your heart. I want you to listen and make sure the Holy Ghost is telling you to get down that street. He said, because you need to know in advance, that way you can take an alternative route. So how many know God will protect you, but you've got to listen to him? Everybody say, God will protect me, but i got to listen to him. Say it again, God will protect me, but i got to listen to him. Now, if you look several months ago, last year, we looked on a Wednesday night about the protection of God. God has a canopy for all of us, but I have to listen. I have to obey. I've got to respond to him. It doesn't just happen because I'm a child of God. It is yours. But when he tells you not to do something and you override that, you've left the protection of God. And so he said, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness. So whether he left the city, then there was all kinds of calamity going out in the wilderness. In perils in the sea. Notice, in perils among what church? False brethren. Everybody say false brethren. Now, go to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, a very familiar scripture to us. If you were here a couple years ago, we taught on this for several months. Matthew chapter 7, and notice what Jesus said. How are we going to know false brethren or not? Well, let's look and find out what the Word says. Go to Matthew chapter 7, Matthew chapter 7, and let's start reading in verse 15. Matthew chapter 7, and notice verse 15. And Jesus, even in his earthly ministry, talked about false prophets. Everybody say it, false prophets. Now, how many of you know there are prophets of God and then there are false prophets? There are false apostles. There are false teachers. There are false evangelists. There are false pastors. How am I going to know what's right and how many am I going to know what isn't right? Let's go to the Word and find out what the Word says. Let the Word judge us and help us so we can stay balanced. Notice in verse 15, Matthew verse chapter 7, verse 15. If you have it, say, I got it. Notice what Jesus said to them even back then. He said, beware of what? What's verse 15 say you're to beware of? Everybody say false prophets. Look at your name and go, beware of false prophets. Man, I could tell you stories about false prophets. I could tell you things that go through the church that people think about, they gravitate about it. It's unscriptural, it's unbiblical, and people get hoodwinked by it and they wonder why they get messed up and wonder why it doesn't come to pass. You've been listening to the wrong spirit. Just because somebody calls themselves a prophet doesn't make them a prophet. It could make them a self-proclaimed prophet. Are you with me? I know several years ago there were people going to meetings about prophecy. Oh, go get your word from God. The problem with that is if you go there and they say something to you contrary, anything in the New Testament that you get now from a word from God, so to speak, because we're all for the gifts of the Spirit, but anything you should be getting or getting from so-called a minister or ministry gift or word, word of wisdom, word of knowledge, you should already kind of already know that in your spirit. And if they tell you something that you don't have a clue about and it's totally left field, you need to throw that in the left field. Because listen, listen carefully, and it's still going on today. I just read a, a little memo uh, of a church down, I believe, in Delaware. You know, come get your word from the prophet. And I'm like, I got my word right here from Genesis, from Genesis to Revelation. Because in the New Testament that we are in, say it with me, New Testament. In the New Testament, the Bible says we are to be led by the Spirit of God. Say that with me. I am to be led by the Spirit of God. Say it again. I'm to be led by by the Spirit of God. Give me chapter and verse. Romans, the 8th chapter, verse 14. 
For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Notice it doesn't say we're to be led by prophets. It doesn't say we're supposed to be led by dreams and visions. Nothing wrong with the prophets of God. If they say what you already know in your heart, nothing wrong with dreams and visions. If when you get up in that dream and vision, you know it's from God. But some people live that whole life like that. And then they get dismayed and they wonder. And they get, man, I call them flaky Christians. I call them weird, flaky Christians. They get out beyond the Word. Why? They're being led by things they're not supposed to be led by. Say it again. I am to be led by the Holy Ghost. Say it again. I'm to be led by the Holy Ghost and the Word of God. See, if you're not sure if it's God or not, then go to the Word of God and find out. By the way, the Holy Ghost is the one that inspired this Word, so anything He says is going to line up with what He inspired men to write to you and I, I can read. Those are our two safety vows we can always go to. What I fear in my spirit and what I read in the Word of God. By the way, in younger years, I have found that I got things, man, if I was a bet man, I would have bet my money it was God, but I found out in the Word of God it was not God. How many know the enemy is a great camouflager? And you better know this Bible inside and out. He's very good. Are you ready for this? The devil comes to church too. He hears things. He'll even quote things. If you go back and read what Jesus, uh, in dealing with Satan in, in the wilderness, he was actually talking about partial scriptures over in Deuteronomy. Go back and look them up. The devil knows some things about the Bible. He's incapable of revelation. He doesn't know the wisdom of God, but he has learned some things. Everybody say he has learned some things. So beware of false prophets. If there's false prophets, then Jesus said beware of false prophets. Do we need to watch out for false prophets? I've always found this out. Anybody that promotes the prophecy or prophets ministry over preaching the Word of God, I'm not going to. I'm going to go to the Word of God first. This Word of God is my one thing I can count on. I have no idea what they're going to say, but I know what this Word says, and it's not going to change. Now, notice, that doesn't mean you're supposed to be scared of it. Just know the Word and go, nope, sorry, I'm not going to your meeting. But notice, he said, beware of false prophets which come to you how, church? Everybody say it, sheep's clothing, verse 15. Matthew 7, verse 15, he said, how the prophets are going to come to you? They're going to come dressed like you. They're going to look like you. They're going to act like you. They're going to be in the services with you. He said, but inwardly they are ravaging wolves. You shall know them. How are we going to know them? You shall know them. Come on, everybody. Verse 16. Everybody say, I will know them by their what? I will know them what? By their fruits. How are you going to know what's real and what isn't real? How are you going to know what's false and what's true? We're going to know them by their fruits. Everybody say, I'm going to know them. By their fruits. What does that mean, I'm going to know them by their fruits? He's talking about you're going to know them, and we're not judging them. We're just simply observing the fruit. Say it again. I'm observing the fruit. See, I want to observe to find out what their life is producing. Is it godly fruit? Is it, is it fruit that's producing and causing growth? Is it helping? Because remember, they're going to appear to you just like us, but inwardly they're ravaging wolves. How many of wolves come to devour? Wolves come to destroy. Wolves come to split. Wolves come to divide. They come to wreak havoc. But good fruit comes to unite. Come on, church. Godly fruit. Do we have godly fruit? Is it being produced? Do we see that? We have to look at that. Watch their doctrine. I mean, we're all growing in our doctrine, but you have to watch what they teach and what they preach and what they say, how they're living. Everybody say it, how they're living. I mean, I don't know about you, but there have been multiple times in my life I've been around people, and I thought, man, this, I believe this person's a child of God. I, I think they're a Christian. And, man, the next thing out of their mouth is all kinds of profanity. And I'm going, whoa, whoa, well, maybe they are. But, man, they they got to they gotta clean that mouth up. Everybody say, clean your mouth up. Can you sin with your mouth? Yes, you can. David said, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable. See, there's no hiding it from God. You may hide it from everybody, but you're not hiding it from God. 
You need to be led by the Spirit of God and know the Word. He said, you should know them by their fruits. He said, do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of this thistle? No. He said, grapes, grapes come on, on, on grape vines. He said, even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. Everybody say it. A good tree brings forth what kind of fruit? Good fruit. But a corrupt tree bringeth forth what? Evil fruit. Verse 18. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree. Now notice he's using the illustration of a tree as the character of an individual. What their lives are producing. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit. Now notice, here's what's going to happen eventually. Every tree that bringeth not forth what kind of fruit? Good fruit. Everybody say good fruit. How many of you want to have good fruit? See, good fruit is something you can see. People can see it. They hear it. I, man, I'll tell you one thing. I've watched them. I've observed them for a long time. I watch how they react. I watch how they live their life. I watch how they talk. I watch how they conduct their lives. And then they go on down. Man, I tell you, they're kids, man. They got it together. I'm telling you, that's good. That's a good report, church. People watch all of us. I used to tell my kids, my kids would come home, and they would say different things to me like, well, we want to do this. And I'd say, no, you're not going to do that. Why can't we do it? Our friends are doing it. I said, I don't care what your friends are doing. What do you mean you don't care what our friends are doing? I said, I could care less what your friends are doing. But their parents say it's all right. I said, I don't care. I'm not their parents. You're my kid and I'm your parents. And you're not going to do that. Now they get mad at me and look at me and go, I just don't understand. Don't you want us to have any fun? I said, no, that's not fun. You just think it's fun. And I've learned. People can't find a flaw in you. They'll look at your kids. Come on, church. Get ever, get the whole house in order. Now he noticed, verse 18, a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down or cut down and cast into what? All right. Now I want you to just think about this for a little bit. That verse. How many of you want to have good fruit? How many of you want to have good fruit? Come on, raise your hand up. How many of you want to have, you better want to have good fruit because listen, if you don't have good fruit, I just read in the Bible, Jesus said in a very nice, polite way that the tree is going to be cut down and cast where? Into the fire. I don't know if you understand this or not, but literally what Jesus was saying is if you on judgment day Stand before him and do not have good fruit in your life. You don't go to heaven. Wow, that's a sobering moment, isn't it? Is there a hell to, to shun? Is there a heaven to gain? Say it with me. There is a heaven to gain. There is a hell to shun. Say it again. There is a heaven to gain. There's a hell to be shunned. But notice what Jesus said about good fruit. Now go to Titus, if you would. Titus. Titus. That's why people, you tell people and they show people these things, they just kind of looks at them like, uh, you know, there, there's, there, there has to be a work. And, and there has to be, um, the people that God need to be at work being, and being producing fruit in their lives. We shouldn't be just sitting in the rocking chair and just talking about it. Let's get out and do it. Hallelujah. Notice here in Titus, Titus chapter 3, Titus chapter 3, and notice writing to Titus, who's a minister, and notice what he said here in Titus chapter 3 and verse 14. Titus chapter 3 and verse 14. And he said, and everybody got verse 14. And let ours also learn to maintain. Everybody say, got to learn to maintain. What are, we, what are we to maintain? Notice. And let us learn. Everybody say, let us learn. In other words, you know, you come to church, you come to be a born-again Christian, you might know, a lot of people don't think, well, I'm saved now, and so I'm in. But no, listen, God's expecting something from you now. He's depositing things into you. You have an inheritance. He's expecting you to do something to produce good fruit. Everybody say it, good fruit. He wants your life to be a good smell to Him. 
He doesn't want your life, 2 Corinthians chapter, he doesn't want your life living and go, whew, man, I tell you what, I know you're a Christian, but man, we've got to clean some things up. That's not a good smell. But notice, he said, and let ours also learn to maintain good works. Everybody say it, maintain good works for necessary uses that they be not, what church? Unfruitful. Say it again, I don't want to be unfruitful. Come on, say it. I don't want to be unfruitful. What happened to the un what happened to the tree that doesn't have any fruit? We just read. What did Jesus say in Matthew chapter 7? It got come on, everybody say, unfruitful. It got cut down and put into the fire. Say it again. Unfruitful. It got cut down and put into the fire. Is God expecting you to do something? He most certainly is. Sitting by is not in the kingdom of God. Now, go to John chapter 15. John chapter 15, Jesus said this. Once again, you got these people, oh, I don't need to go to church. Yes, you do need to go to church. You not only need to go to church, but you need to be there faithfully and then put your hand to the plow so that you have something to show for your salvation instead of just you. Notice Jesus speaking, and he's talking about the vine, but once again, we get down to verse 8 and 9. He talks about bearing fruit, bearing more fruit, and bearing much fruit. John chapter 15 and verse 1. John 15, verse 1. And he said, I am the true vine. Who's the true vine? Come on, who's the true vine? What's the one person you want to be connected to? It is Jesus, absolutely. I am the true vine, and my Father, referring to God, is the husbandman. Who's the gardener, the one that leads the pruning? God looks down by the and asks, tells the Holy Ghost, you need to tell so-and-so they need to cut that out. They need to stop that. That's not pleasing to me. That's not the direction I want them. He's the one that's running at the pruning system through the Holy Ghost. He said, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, what does he do, church? Come on, everybody say, takes it away. You remember what happened to the unfruitful tree? What happened to the unfruitful tree? Say it again. It gets cut down. Throw it into the fire. you got to remember that, church. Don't let yourself be that way. Well, I thought I was saved and get up and go, no, you're not saved. A lot of people think they're saved. Proverbs says there, way, there is a way that seemeth right unto men, but in the end destruction. There's a lot of people think they're going to heaven, and they're not going to heaven. They must be born again, first of all. Notice, and every branch in me that beareth fruit, for he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth, everybody say it, more fruit. Come on, say it again, more fruit. See, we're talking about false witnesses or false, false uh, brothers. We won't want to be this, so we want to have the evidence to prove that I'm not a false brother. Verse 3, now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me and I in you as the branch, that's you and I, cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can you except you abide in me. See, there's a lot of people on Judgment Day, they're going to show, you know, the Lord all these things that they did, all these things that they planned, and all of their accomplishments, and the Lord will say, no, that's what you wanted to do. What did you do for me? Remember, he's talking about the branch can't produce fruit by itself. Now, you can do things by yourself, but the only fruit that's going to count is what you did in Christ, what you did for Him, what you obeyed Him to do. And a lot of people are going to be like that. They're going to get a big disappointment. And he said, except it abide in me, abide in the vine, and no more can you except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Verse 5, and he that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. Everybody say it, much fruit. Say it again, much fruit. Now notice verse 2 said more fruit, now it's much fruit. For without me you can do what, church? In other words, if you're not connected to him, all the fruit that you're bearing that you think is good, that you're going to, man, God's going to be impressed by, it's no fruit. As far as God's concerned on Judgment Day, the only fruit that's going to be counted worthy of is godly fruit, that you obeyed him. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. So once saved, 
always saved. Jesus said that's not the case. You've got to abide in him. You've got to stay walking with him. Everybody say, stay walking with him. Write this scripture down. Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 to 13, talks about the ten virgins. See, they all started out virgins. Only ten of them he called wise because the ten of them maintained their relationship. They kept oil, and they kept their light lit. They kept walking in the light. They kept fellowshipping with God. But the foolish ones, everybody say the foolish ones. The foolish ones, what happened? They didn't maintain their relationship. The oil is a type of relationship by the Spirit of God, with the Holy Ghost, through the Father God. They didn't. What happened? Their fire started going out. How many of you remember the story? And then what did they want to do when they realized Christ was coming? The foolish that wasted away their time on their plans and on their agendas, their light was going out, but they had to begin with the same as the wise did, but the wise fellowship with God, they got refreshed, they got renewed, they stayed in the light, they walked in the light, they kept their relationship with God on fire. Come on, church. And then what happened to these people that didn't? When they realized it, they said, hey, give us some of yours. I like their response. I'm going to put it to you in modern-day terminology. I'm not giving you any of my life because this is my life, and I'm not going to hell for you. That's basically what they were telling them. I'm not giving it to you because no, both of them is not going down. I maintain, and I'm going to get the benefit of it. That's why I said I'm not going to hell for anybody. I'll try to take as many people as I can with me, but if they don't want to follow me, as the old hymnal song, don't none go with me, I'm still going to follow him. My old, because listen, you're going to find people, and this is how your relationships are going to be. You're going to find people that are going to follow you for a little while, and then they just don't want to go to that next level. They don't want to grow. They don't want to go on with you. And listen, you have one choice, or you have two choices. You either stay back with them and never grow, or you decide to grow. And when you do, by the way, you're probably going to lose them. They'll stay down here in a lower level. But I want all God has for me. Anybody else with me? I want all he has for me. But that takes a determination. Ever say it takes a determination. Now notice, verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, notice not just being born again, not just being in Christ, but now putting the word of God in you, you shall ask what you will, and what's the result when you ask according to the word that's in you? It shall be what, church? Done unto you. If you want to know how to get your prayers answered, underline verse 7. This is how you get your prayers answered. If you're a born-again Christian and you know that you're saved, Jesus taught on prayer, and here's what he said. He said, if you're abiding in me, you're a born-again, you're a Christian, you're a child of God. Well, if you're born again, you're halfway there. Everybody say, I'm halfway there. Now, he said, here's what to do about your prayer life. He said, if the Word abides in you, whatever you're going to ask Him for, get, take the time to get the Word in your spirit. That way, and see, this, this will eliminate you praying selfish prayers. This will eliminate you praying prayers that are going to be, as James says, praying amiss. There's nothing more frustrating than doing the right thing but not doing the right application. You don't get the result. You can pray, which is good. Jesus taught us to pray, and He said to pray, and his goal is he wants to answer us, but he also told us how to pray so he can answer us. Notice he said, pray the Word. Everybody say it. Pray the Word. Say it again. Pray the Word. And notice, what did he say in verse 7? He said, if the words, if and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will. See, if you can find it in the Word of God, it's yours. If you can't find it in the Word of God, then God hasn't promised it, then he will not answer that prayer. That's why it's so important to pray the Word. That's why I, I get so tickled at these people on Facebook. I'm having a problem, and that's all they say, pray for me. And then people put down underneath it, praying, 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 praying. I'm going, you're wasting your time. You need to find out what the problem is. Maybe they're sick. Maybe they have a financial problem. Maybe they're dealing with suicide. Maybe they're dealing with depression. You don't know how to, oh, God, please help them. And then he's going to go, okay, what do you want me to do? Well, I don't know, just help them. That's not what Jesus said to pray. He didn't say pray that way. He said pray the Word. 
This word is the answer. This word is the promise. And he said, you shall ask what you will. Verse 7, everybody got verse 7? And it shall, everybody say, it shall be done unto me. Verse 8, herein is my Father glorified. What brings glory to God? That you bear what kind of fruit? Much fruit. Everybody say, bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. What are disciples of the Lord? Disciples are people that bear much fruit. Do we have any disciples for the Lord in this place? What's our goal and our object? We're here to bear more fruit. We're here to bear lots of fruit. We're here to bear much. Everybody say much fruit. Remember, Jesus said you're not to let your light be hid. You don't cover it. You don't put it under the bed. Go back to Mark, the fourth chapter, talking about the parable of the sower. At the end of that, he talks about hiding the light. He literally means we are not to hide the word. This word is supposed to be put out so people can hear it, so people can see it, and we're supposed to live it so they have the example. And then God looks down, and 2 Corinthians chapter 2 says, man, that's a good smell for my kids. Man, they're doing a good job down there today. Everybody say, God said we're doing a good job. Say it again. We're doing a good job. Now, go to one more scripture. I want you to go to Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11. False prophets. We'll know them by their fruits. Don't be surprised. They might act nice, smile, might even sing songs, praise God. But look at the fruit. Watch the fruit. Watch the fruit. Are they trying to seduce people? They're trying to get a following. It never fails. They always want to get a following. They want to get a crowd. They want to get people to follow them. Look at me. Oh, watch me. Oh, you need to go here. You need to go there. Be careful about that. Notice here in Mark, the 11th chapter, Mark, the 11th chapter in verse 11, Mark 11, verse 11. Notice he talked about the fig tree. Everybody say the fig tree. And notice because Jesus is now, why would Jesus just curse a fig tree out of nowhere? In the natural, you think it doesn't make sense, but I believe there's a message here for us. Jesus is not just looking for people that look like Christians. He's looking for people when he comes and inspects them that they have something on them. And it's called fruit or evidence. Notice in verse 11, it's called, my heading says, a fig tree rebuked. Mark 11, verse 11. If you have it, say, I got it. And Jesus entered into Jerusalem and into the temple. So have you ever noticed how many times when you read the Gospels, when Jesus went into a city, I mean, he went right into the temple or went right into the synagogue. And most of the time, as soon as he got in there, the first thing, if you don't read over it real quick, the first thing he went in to do was to teach people. Everybody say, to teach people. Come on, everybody say, Jesus taught the Word of God. Say it again, Jesus taught the Word of God. Now, keep your finger there, and I'm going to prove it to you. Go back to Matthew chapter 4. That's not very far back in Jesus' ministry, is it? Matthew chapter 4. We just read these things over, and then we, we, just, we can't understand why Jesus, why he healed this person, but why he didn't heal this person. And here's the result. If we'll begin to study the Word, we'll find out why some get healed and why some don't get healed. There were actually moves of God that Jesus, uh, that Jesus was a part of that the Father wanted to do, and people know nobody got anything. Why? Because they, they didn't want to hear the Word. And see, if you don't want to hear the Word, then your help is not going to be around. You're not going to get the help because your help comes from the Word. Now notice, in Matthew chapter 4, Matthew chapter 4, Matthew chapter 4, and verse 23, Matthew 4, verse 23, if you have it, say, I got it. And see, once again, we'll, we like the last half of this verse, we'll remember and quote that, but what we're learning is that that sets up for him healing all manner of sickness and all disease. How could he do that? Well, we go back to verse 23, the first half. And Jesus, verse 23, if you got it, say, I got it. And Jesus went about all Galilee. Everybody say, all Galilee. So Jesus did this in the Galilee. Apparently, everywhere he went, this is what he was doing. Teaching in their synagogues. What was the first thing recorded that Jesus did in all of Galilee? Come on, everybody say, teaching. In their synagogues, notice not synagogue, but synagogue. As soon as he went to one of the synagogues or the temple, what did he do? He went right in and he started teaching. Everybody say, right in and started teaching. 
Why? He's setting people up to receive the word. Remember, Jesus said, if you can believe, all things are possible. But if you don't have the word on it, you can't believe it. You can get a miracle from God. If you have the word on it and get that word in you and believe it, you can get a miracle from God. I, my wife and I, we have proof right there. She's a miracle. There was a time, and we have it medically in file, that there was a time that she was a blob. No arms, no legs. At that time of the pregnancy, she was to have arms. She was to have legs. She had nothing. The terminology was a blow, what was it called? Bloviated? A blighted what? Ovum, which just simply means just a blob. No form of a body. We come home. We didn't tell everybody. We got home. We got enough people that we knew that were faith people. We trusted on them, and we just prayed. We went back a week later. She had two arms. She had two legs. She had all of her fingers and all of her toes. You can get anything you want from God if you have the Word on it. But see, people don't want to hear the Word. They don't take the time to hear the Word. What's Jesus doing in Matthew chapter 4? He's teaching them the will of God. If he can teach them, and by the way, he taught them the kingdom of God. That's why he got people healed in some places. There were some places he did not get people healed. See, we just read the scriptures and we think, well, everywhere Jesus went, he just got. No, there were places that he did not get people healed. In his own hometown, the Bible says that he wanted to do great signs and wonders, but he couldn't do that. It didn't say he didn't want to. It said he couldn't. And the next verse, it says he marveled at their unbelief. Say it with me. Unbelief hinders the move of God. Say it again. Unbelief hinders the move of God. So notice, what did he do when he went into the synagogue? Not just one, but multiple. He began to teach the Word. He began to preach. Everybody say, teach the Word. Preach the gospel of the kingdom. And now notice, when you teach the word, preach the word, guess what happens? If they'll receive it, then he can heal. Notice what happened. And healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought unto him all the sick people that were taken with divers diseases and torments and those which were possessed with devils and those which were lunatic and those that had palsies. And he did what, church? Everybody say, he healed them. But see, what set the stage was him teaching and preaching about the kingdom of God. Everybody say, teach the word, preach the word, heal the sick. Say it again. Teach the word, preach the word, heal the sick. Now, go back to the fig tree, Mark 11, in last conclusion. Mark 11, verse 11. Mark 11, verse 11. And Jesus entered into Jerusalem and into the temple. And when he was looking around about upon all things, and now the eventide was come, he went out unto Bethany with the twelve. And on the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. Say it with me, Jesus was hungry. Do you know Jesus ate just like you and I did? He ate just like you and I did. He had food. He was a human being just like you and I. Yes, he was the son of God, but he was also the son of man. Notice, and seeing a fig tree afar off. Having leaves, everybody say, having leaves. He came, now, why is Jesus going to that fig tree? Because a fig tree produces what? Say it with me, a fig tree produces figs. He's hungry. He's going to the fig tree to eat off of that fig tree. We could say he's going to get some fruit off of that tree to get some nourishment off of that tree, right? And he seen a fig tree afar off having leaves. He came if happily he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found what on it, church? Come on, what did he find on the church? Everybody say, found nothing. Did the tree look like a fig tree? Look like a fig tree. Did it have any fruit like a fig tree? No. Now, we know if you read the whole account that apparently this fig tree in that setting, it wasn't the time of the season. But see, there's a lesson for us. Remember our main text we went and we started off in 2 Corinthians chapter 2? The Lord knows those that are His, doesn't He? 
He knows those who are true believers. What did Jesus say in Matthew chapter 7? A tree that doesn't have good fruit, what does it do? It gets what? Everybody say, we, we got a guy that cuts trees for a living right here, Robert. He knows about cutting trees down. You cut them down, and what happens when the tree gets cut down? It doesn't just lay there. It's cast what? Into the fire. That's a picture of hell, isn't it? Here we find again. We find Jesus coming to a fig tree. Do you remember another time where Jesus uses the illustration, and he talked to his disciples, and he used illustrations, and he said, he said, I came to you and was hungry, and you fed me. I came to you, and I was sick, and you visited me. How do you remember that? There was another time Jesus said, uh, I was in prison, and you visited me. How do you remember Jesus talking about that? And the disciples went, Lord, when were you sick? When, when did we feed you? When did we, when did we do all this? This is a parallel going right along with this. He said, for as much as you've done it unto the least of them, other believers, you've done it unto me. See, Jesus is expecting us to produce something. Not just look like we're Christians, but he's expecting some fruit from us. Say it again, some fruit from us. So listen, when Jesus comes to us in the form of another brother or, or, or brother or sister, we have the capacity to minister to them. So if they're hungry, we can feed them. If they're sick, listen, if they're sick, we can minister to them. What do you think you're going to minister to the sick? You're going to minister healing. Come on, church. But notice, let's read on. Matthew chapter 11. And on the morrow when they, notice, in, at verse 11, I'm sorry. And when he was looked down around upon the things, which are now the even time was come, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. And on the morrow when they were come of Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he happily, he came, if, if happily, he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of the fig was not yet. Notice verse 14. And Jesus answered and saith unto it. Everybody say, Jesus spoke to the fig tree. Come on, everybody say it. Jesus spoke to the fig tree. Notice he wasn't talking to the disciples. He spoke to it. And said unto it, No man shall eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples, what did they do, church? They heard it. Now, here's something really funny. They come back the next day. They see the, the tree. Now the tree didn't instantly die. They come back the next day. And Peter points it out and said, Look, Lord, the tree that you cursed, it dried from the roots up. See, sometimes you just need to speak the word of God. And one of the songs we sang about speaking the name of Jesus over our families, you just need to keep speaking the name of Jesus and keep speaking the Word of God. If nothing happens, just keep at it. Everybody say it. Just keep at it. Come on, look at your name and go, and keep at it. Don't you dare stop. And so notice, notice the funny thing is, in chapter 11, we find Jesus speaking to the fig tree, and it died. Now he's up in the ante to his disciples in verse 23, and he says, hey, listen, guys, you need to operate in the God kind of faith. Everybody say the God kind of faith. Verse 22 says, have the faith of God, or the literal Greek says, have the operate in the God kind of faith. How many of you know you already, if you're born again, you have the God kind of faith? Say it with me. The day that I got saved, the Bible says, I have from God the measure of faith. Say it again. I have from God the the measure of faith. I'm not going to tell you where it's at. Look it up. It's in the New Testament. The day you got saved, God gave you the measure of faith. For you to say you don't have faith, you're lying to yourself. You do have the God kind of faith. What you need to do is feed your faith and start your doubts. Keep putting the Word in you. But here it says in verse 23, it's amazing, Jesus up the ante, and in verse 23 he took it from speaking to the tree, and notice he spoke to the tree. How many remember Jesus speaking to the weather? How many of you know he spoke to the water? And the men, they were marveled at those things. Now he's speaking to a fig tree. Notice he's not praying. Go back and read it. He's not praying. 
He's taking his authority. Say it with me. He's taking his authority. By the way, he delegated to the church, and he called it a key to the kingdom of heaven. He said, I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. That's keys to the kingdom of heaven. In other words, those are keys that God gave the believer that they can bind and loose. Jesus now is telling them, hey, guys, speak to the mountain. Say it with me. Speak to the mountain. Say it again. Speak to the mountain. Say it one more time. I am to speak to the mountain. What does that mean? I believe it literally means the mountain. After all, he already spoke to storms. He spoke to great bodies of water. He spoke to a fig tree. He literally said, speak to the mountain. And by the way, he said this. If you will believe it when you speak to it, not prayer, but speak to it, if you believe it, it'll be removed. We could put it this way. Whatever you have in your life, if it seems like an absolute mountain that's unmovable, if you find the Word of God on it, you need to start speaking to that and speaking to it and speaking to it and speaking to it. And Jesus said, if you believe that, that mountain will be removed no matter how big it is but you have to do it. Most of the time, here's what we do. We talk about it. We complain about it. We pray about it. We'll get other people to pray for us about it. We'll lay up alongside it. Some people will even go as far as almost idolizing it. And Jesus said, you're to speak to it and get it out of your life. You want keys to the kingdom of heaven? You've got them, but Jesus won't do it for you. You have to do it. Now, see, once again, this is the difference between false brothers and brothers. Godly brothers do the Word. Say it with me. Godly brothers and godly sisters, we do the Word of God. Close your Bibles and stand up if you would, please. Hallelujah. Because we're good trees, right? I said we're good trees, right? Come on, say it. I am a good tree. Come on, say it again. I am a good tree. I'm not going to be cut down because I'm going to bear more fruit, lots of fruit, much fruit. I'm not going to be cut down. I'm not going to hell. I'm going to heaven. But Jesus is expecting me to bear fruit, to bear evidence. Thank you, Lord, for giving me the Word of God for giving me the helper, the Holy Ghost, on the inside. Thank you, Father, for the word that I have received. I'm a good tree. I am determined to be a good tree and to stay a good tree. I'm not going to change. And when Jesus comes to me with a need for the body of Christ, as I've been serving you, obeying you, and in fellowship with you, preparing myself, getting myself ready, like the wise virgins, establishing my relationship, and keeping my relationship on fire and in the light, when a need comes, when a person comes that needs answers, I'm prepared. I'm ready. I'm established in the Word of God. I have the name of Jesus. I have the Word of God. And by your unction, by your leading, you will lead me. You will tell me what to say. Show me what to do. And I will minister to all of humanity just like Jesus did, bearing good fruit doing good works, and you'll get all the praise, you'll get all the glory. I'm a vessel determined to be a valuable vessel, a value and a vessel that brings honor to you, that represents the kingdom of God and the things of God and your personality and your character and your love and compassion that you have for us. Use us, Lord. Use me, Lord, and I'll bring you the glory. 
I'll bring you all the praise, and I'll give you all the glory, and I'll give you all the praise. Thank you, Father, for what you have done, but I know there's so much more. I'm preparing myself to bear more fruit, to bear much fruit. I must continue. Come on, make this your confession. I must continue to study the Word of God. I must continue to hear the Word of God. I must continue to meditate on the Word of God. I must continue to pray. I must continue to confess the Word of God. I must continue. Come on, say these things. I must continue to be a doer of the Word. Thank you, Father, for what you have shown me. It may seem a little. It may, it may seem small. But, Father, when the opportunity arises, I will do the Word of God. I will use what you have given me. I will be faithful over the little, and much will be added, and more revelation will be given unto me, and I'll give you all the praise, all the glory. Thank you, Father. I am determined to be a good tree, not like the fig tree, that I'm bearing fruit. I'm not a false witness. I'm not a false brother, but I am truly a child of God. I'm letting my light shine, and I'm going to bear godly fruit. And when you come with a need, or maybe you come because you're hungry, I'll have something to give you. It'll be godly fruit back into your life. Thank you, Father. We give you all the praise, all the glory in Jesus' name. Everybody shout amen. Turn around and tell somebody, I am a godly man or a godly woman, and I am bearing godly fruit, not just today, but every day. When I leave this place, I am taking Jesus with me to the highways, to the byways, to my house, to my workplace, and I'm going to let my light shine and give Him all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. Everybody shout amen.